Amen. Uh, so if you grab your Bibles this morning, open up to 2 Corinthians, 2 Corinthians in chapter number 10. We do have an outline for this morning's lesson. Did that get around to everybody? Um, okay, so everyone's got one that needs one. And those of you online, what I tried to do, um, so I, I sent the outline and the PowerPoint um, by email to those um, that don't use Facebook. And then I uh, put the outline and the, the, the outline and the link to the PowerPoint. Uh, uh, less, uh, um, I put that on, on Facebook as well. And in fact, on several different places on Facebook. So those of you that want that can have it and uh, use that to follow along with the lesson this morning. We're going to be in, i got to find 2 Corinthians 2, don't I? Yeah. Um, <clears throat> Second Corinthians and chapter number 10. I want to read verses 1 through 6 this morning as uh, we begin the Sunday School lesson today. We're going to be looking at a, a subject that is, uh, I, this is an interesting passage for me to, to teach today um, because it is one that I think we are all, Almost every Christian I know is familiar with um, at least a good portion, a part of this passage, but I don't know that hardly anyone sees this verse in context. I think we look at this passage of scripture and, you know, it's got a, it's got like this shiny gold nugget right on the top. And so we are satisfied with the nugget and we never look at the whole context that verses the weapons of warfare are not carnal but mighty through God to the pulling down of strongholds. We all know that verse, and you know the weapons of warfare are warfare are not uh, carnal, and we all know that. And you know when we think about that, people talk about things like. But there is a there is a specific context in which um, it is used in the Word of God, and that context is actually I think consider is very powerful. And so that's what we're going to be looking at today. So we're going to begin in verse 1, 2 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 1, down to verse 6. The Bible says, Now I, Paul, myself beseech you by the meekness and gentleness of Christ, who in presence and in presence am base among you, but being absent and bold towards you. But I beseech you that I may not be bold when I am present with, with that confidence wherewith I think to be bold against some, which think of us as if we walked according to the flesh. For though we walk in the flesh, we do not war after the flesh. For the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty through God to the pulling down strongholds, casting down imaginations and every high thing that exalteth itself against the knowledge of God and bringing into captivity every thought to the obedience of Christ. And having a readiness to revenge all disobedience when your obedience is fulfilled. Let me have a word of prayer. Father, I want to ask you now uh, that you'd help me uh, as I begin to, um, to try to expound, open up this passage of Scripture uh, and explain it as um, in the book of Ezra, it talks about the scribes expounded. They would read the word of God and then the scribes would expound or explain that passage, whatever had been read uh, to the people. And Lord, that's what we're going to try to do today. And I want to ask Heavenly Father for your spirit's help and, uh, and clarity of mind. And uh, Lord, uh, both help in the ability to speak and also, Lord, the help in the ability to hear. Lord God, I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. So let me remind you about the lesson uh, from last week a little bit. In last week's lesson, I said that verses 1 and 2 uh, of this passage, chapter 10, verses 1 and 2 give us two tools. I call them tools um, that the Apostle Paul said he had in dealing with troublemakers. There were troublemakers there in the church at Corinth. Uh, the church itself had embraced the message, the corrections that he had that uh, he had um, given to them in Jack in uh, First Corinthians. Uh, the church primarily had done that, but there was a segment, a sect, uh, a group in the church. The we call them Judaizers, who were causing trouble. They. Uh, did not accept the message that the Apostle Paul preached. They did not accept him, in fact, as, a, as an apostle, and they're giving, giving him trouble. And so what I said the last time was that there were, Paul tells us about two tools that he had to deal with the troublemakers in this in this church. Those two tools were, first of all, uh, beseeching. He had the, the ability to uh, to appeal to them, to uh, to. Uh, uh, beg them, if you will, to appeal to them and ask them uh, in kindness and love uh, to to please, you know, comply. Listen, this is 
this is the message and this is the word of God and this is what we're taught to do and this is what I, I, I mean, all I'm doing is teaching you the word of God here. Please comply, please repent, please submit, please come along with this beseeching. But, and he said, listen, I wanna, I'm asking you please to repent and comply with the beseeching so that I don't have to use the second tool which is boldness. And he said that there's, he's confident enough to be bold. He knew what he believed was right. And he was confident enough to exercise boldness if that was, exercise boldness to the point that um, people might even think he was in the flesh. He was willing to be so bold, he was confident enough to be so bold as a person watching him Practice this extreme boldness, might look in you know, extreme behavior, might even say, Man, you're get, don't get in the flesh of this thing. And he said it's not in the flesh. He's gonna tell us that uh, you know, they're gonna they they might look at it and think that's what it is, but it isn't, and he's gonna describe that uh, as we get in the as we go on in the passage. So um Paul um I uh, said that the, the beseeching took first. The Apostle Paul would have preferred to see the troublemakers uh, repent and get right with God, submit to the gospel that he preached, but he warned them that if he didn't repent, he was very capable of being so bold that they would mistake it for being twice. I, I use the word tools, um, beseeching and boldness. I used in that lesson the word tools. The Bible defines the tool of boldness with the word weapons. You're going to see that, the weapons of our warfare. Um, and I just want to point out to you right now, um, you think about, you know, doing things in the flesh and, you know, people uh, seeing a, 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 a certain behavior and saying, well, that's worldly, that's fleshly. And, and Paul is going to, he's trying to explain to them that while they are interpreting it as being fleshly, it absolutely is not. Well, don't you know today there are plenty of people who would listen to a Christian use the term weapon and use the term warfare and say, that's not godly. Jesus would never use a weapon. Jesus would never go to war. And yet these are terms that we find throughout the New Testament, especially you find it practiced in the Old Testament, but you find uh, um, there is a spiritual kind of weapon and a spiritual kind of warfare um, that is found throughout the New Testament. And, and um, so the, uh, the weapons, it's a pretty serious term. And I, what I think it tells us is that, the, is that the word of God, God takes troublemakers in church seriously. God handles them in a serious manner, the words war and weapons. So um, with that as kind of an introduction, let's get into the three points of the outline today. First of all, I want to point out um, the nature of these weapons, the weapons of our warfare. So he says in verse four, for the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty through God to the pulling down of strongholds, the nature of of our weapons. Now, uh, there's, um, I have no shortage of biblical built material to work through here uh, because the New Testament is so very specific concerning the subject and uh, concerning this concept of these weapons and what nature they have and what those weapons are. So we've got Ephesians chapter 6 verses 10 through 18 is a very specific written by the same apostle. This is the Holy Spirit of God who's leading through it. So it wouldn't have if it would have been written by Peter. I'd have been able to use the weapons of our warfare in the book of 2 Corinthians and I'd have been able to use the uh, whole armor of God uh, uh, in uh, Ephesians. I'd have been able to use them together even if it had been Peter who was the penman of, of Ephesians because it's the Holy Spirit of God who is the author of the whole book. But Ephesians chapter 6 verses 10 through 18 written by the same apostle and he writes and says finally my brethren be strong in the Lord in the power of his might for put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil for we wrestle not against flesh and blood but against principalities against powers against the rulers of the darkness of this world against spiritual wickedness in high places wherefore take unto you the whole armor of God that you may be able to withstand in the evil day and having done all to stand stand therefore having your loins girt about with truth and having on the breastplate of righteousness and your feet shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace Above all, taking the shield of faith, wherewith ye shall be able to quench all the fiery darts of the wicked, and take the helmet of salvation and the sword of spirit, which is the word of God, 
praying always with all prayer and supplication in the spirit and watching thereunto with all perseverance and supplication uh, for all saints. So uh, I want to give you three comments um, based on, um, you know, obviously what we see in Second Corinthians, but now applying this uh, passage in Ephesians to that. Number one, I want to point, I want to point out that these weapons are not carnal. He tells us that in, verse, in Ephesians 10, uh, Ephesians 6, verse 10 through 13. Finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. Why? For we wrestle not against flesh and blood. This isn't carnal. This isn't a carnal battle. For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. Wherefore, take unto you the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand withstand in the evil day and having done all to stand. So um, our weapons are, our warfare is not a carnal warfare. Therefore, our weapons are not carnal weapons. However, they are powerful and they are mighty. Just because they are not carnal uh, is no reason to expect that they are not powerful. They have the ability to defeat. They have the ability, we're going to see in a few minutes, to cast down. They have that ability. They are powerful. Um, it, it, we're mighty. It means authoritative. Um, uh, it's the weapons of our warfare, or this, this battle that we're in. The, the person who wields these weapons, he's not a milk toast. He's, 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 he's not someone you run, that can easily be run over. You know, it's not that kind of a thing. Um, in fact, it is, these weapons, when used um, when used um, properly, uh, will cause the devil to flee. The devil himself. So um, they're not carnal. Number two, these weapons. Um, uh, when he describes this whole armor of God, this way, first of all, he talks about the. He says that we have armor. We have armor. Ephesians. Chapter 6, verses 14 uh, through 17, the first part of verse 17. Stand, therefore, having your loins stirred about with truth and having on the breastplate of righteousness and your feet shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace. Above all, taking the shield of faith wherewith ye shall be able to quench all the fiery darts of the wicked and take the helmet of salvation. Now, all that he's described so far, all of that is armor. It's defensive. It's um, they're not weapons. These things are not weapons. These are, this is armor. Its purpose is to stop the blows of the enemy. In my mind, I, I, I wrestle with it right now to say this, but in my mind, when I think of armor, I think about um, those, um, the, the vehicles that they're using in the Middle East right now. They're running around in armor plated um, Humvees and things like that that are, they are designed to withstand um, a blast and uh, to to protect the persons inside it from uh, bullets and um, and that can't it's not perfect it doesn't stop everything but uh, but it is designed to protect the persons inside and these all this armor that God has given to us is designed to protect us now um, it it is perfect I don't want to say it isn't perfect but um, uh, it is perfect but uh, even you know armor um, things get through armor sometimes. You can wear your armor, wear all of this armor, and still have things that hurt, still have things that affect you in some way. But they are designed by God to, uh, to, to protect you in the, uh, in the warfare, the combat that, that God has placed you in. So there we have some armor. And then we also have some weapons in Ephesians chapter 6, verses 17 and 18. And this, uh, seven, the last part of verse 17. And the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God, praying always with all prayer and supplication of the Spirit, and watching uh, thereunto with all perseverance and supplication for the saints. So he gives us two weapons. And I think it's interesting what the weapons are. He, the two weapons, we have prayer and we have the word. Those are our two weapons. We have, and I think it's interesting, remember what the apostle said in the book of Acts. He says, we're going to give ourselves, uh, it's not me that we go and serve tables. We're going to give ourselves to what? They were going to give themselves to prayer and to the ministry of the word. We're going to devote ourselves to combat. That's what they said. I'm going to need 
others in the church to take care of um, serving tables, waiting on tables. We're going to need someone to do that, the apostle said, so that we can continue in combat, in prayer, and the ministry of the word. By the way, the fact that uh, the apostle, it doesn't mean that you, you, you also have prayer in the ministry of the word. You are also um, uh, able to use those things. But I want to tell you, um, you should covet uh, um, a preacher who uh, spends his, dedicates himself to those two things. That, that's what you need your preacher to do. You may want your preacher to do other things. This is what you need your preacher to do. He needs to be dedicated to prayer and to the ministry of the word. Um, then, so let's go on to the next thing. There's the nature of the weapons. Uh, and we're back into 2 Corinthians now. And uh, did you notice that, Brother Fred, that I watched to make sure that I'm on point number two? I did that just for you. And so then now we saw the nature of our weapons. Now let's look at the, uh, the objective of our weapons. That's in verse 5, 2 Corinthians 10, verse 5. Casting down imaginations in every high thing that exalteth itself against the knowledge of God and bringing into captivity every thought to the obedience of Christ. So he says, we've got these weapons. They are not that they're, they're not carnal, but they are mighty. And what do they do? They cast down imaginations and every, he says, cast down imagination, every high thought that exalted itself against the knowledge of God, etc. So these, these Judaizers, they imagined all sorts of doctrines that um, deviated from the things that the Apostle Paul taught. He's had to contend with them. We know in the book of Acts in chapter 15, the book of Galatians is the Apostle Paul uh, contending with the uh, Judaizers. Uh, Ephesians chapters 1, 2, 3 especially are, um, they are his, his um, attack, if you will, uh, against the Judaizers, uh, uh, those people who didn't want Jews and Gentiles to worship together and, 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 and all of those sorts of things. He deals with them. So here's what he says. So now we're going to get, all right, now I've got these weapons and they are mighty weapons. And I, please, I'm begging you repent. I don't want to use these weapons on you because they are mighty. But here's the objective. Here's my objective. I'm going to cast down, number one, I'm going to cast down, I'm working to cast down imaginations. In other words, he wants to dispose of the false doctrines, casting down, that's not a, that's not, that's a violent term. All right, it's, it's a violent term. He wants to take their, their imaginations, these things that they're thinking and these doctrines they've come up with, these ideas that, that they've come up with that are opposed to the gospel that the Paul preached. And he said, I want to cast them down. And then he says, not only that, I want to capture every thought. Um, and, I, and, you know, a lot of times we'll use that passage and we're thinking about, you know, casting. We're going to capture our thoughts. I even pray that like, help me to capture my thoughts when um, and I'm in, in a church service. So that I'm not thinking about other things. I want to be focused on. But what he's saying here is he said, no, um, to these Judaizers, I, he says, I want you to know when I get there, I have the ability to cast down your false doctrines. I have the ability to capture your thoughts, and I will do it. I will take them prisoner. I'm, I have the confidence and the boldness, he says, to do those sorts of things. I want to teach I want to teach people not to let their minds run to and fro with every wind of doctrine. And then, and the third part of that objective is to bring them into the obedience of Christ. So um, the carnal mind, and you know this is true, the carnal mind is by nature rebellious. It's not obedient, it's rebellious. All of us, the, to the truth is, every human being alive, it doesn't matter whether you're saved, lost, or matter who you are, every human being alive is rebellious by nature. If you have to, you have to work at not being rebellious. You're going. You're gonna. All of us. Uh, we are going to be rebellious in our mind. In our uh, if it's if 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 um, unless we do something to uh, to not be rebellious, it's going to happen. Uh, and so this carnal rebellious it wants control. And and the objective of the Bible preacher is to stomp out the rebellious mind and bring it into the obedience of into the obedience of Christ to uh, to so minister and so work. The reason I'm going to use these weapons of warfare. He says, is to is to cast down imagination, to um, capture uh, every thought, and bring 
um, it into the obedience of the Lord Jesus Christ. I, I want people to, um, I want to, I want to capture the rebellion and I want to see obedience come about. That's what the objective is. Um, I want to see the rebellion stopped out of your life, and I want to see obedient the obedience to Jesus Christ take its place. That's what the preacher is trying to do, and in um, in, uh, in the lives of, uh, of others. And so, and then we're going to go into the the uh, the third point, and then so that I can finish the lesson this morning. Uh, but then there's the the inclination of these weapons, and I think this is an interesting passage. So. Um, <clears throat> There's the nature. These weapons are not carnal, but they are mighty. The objective is to cast down uh, imaginations and blah, 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 and not blah, blah, blah in the back, but and, and then to bring thoughts into obedience of Christ. And then the inclination of the weapons. I want to show you that in verse 6. And having a readiness to revenge all disobedience when your obedience is fulfilled. So the inclination is readiness, having a readiness. My Weapons are ready. My weapons are ready. A, a good military uh, is well trained and it's always ready. Um, you know, if uh, an enemy attacks, an, uh, uh, an enemy nation attacked the United States of America, um, our president wouldn't be able to, it wouldn't work like this. He couldn't call up the enemy and say, wait a minute, wait a minute, give us six months, we're not ready. No, you, you've got to be ready all the time. It's the readiness that actually prevents the enemy from thinking it can attack. <laughs> Ready all of the time. And uh, the Apostle Paul says uh, that he is ready, his weapons are ready, that he is prepared, and he's ready to deal with these spiritual hooligans, these troublemakers there at Corinth. He is ready to do something. But there's an interesting construction that takes place in, in, in this verse. I'll get uh, there, look at it from right here, where he says, um, having a readiness to revenge all disobedience, or I am ready to deal with the disobedience so that it can be captured and brought into obedience. Then he says, um, when your obedience is fulfilled. That's a really interesting phrase. So I'm ready to um, bring into obedience, or I'm, I'm, I'm going to read it again. I'm ready to revenge disobedience once you are obedient. It's an interesting con, uh, phrase that happens here. And here's, uh, so I want to read to you some things. This is what Albert Barnes um, writes. He says, I'm ready, but not everybody in your church is ready. I'm not going to use my weapons until everyone is ready. So here's what Albert Barnes writes about that. He says, Paul was ready to inflict, and I like these words, to inflict discipline when the church had showed a readiness to obey his laws and to do its own duty, delicately in intimating that the reason why it wasn't done yet was the lack of entire promptness on the church itself and that it could not be done on any offender as long as the church itself was not prepared to sustain it. In other words, Paul was ready to take on the troublemakers in the church at Corinth, but he knew the church wouldn't support him in it, wouldn't back him in it. I'm not going to pull out my sword and start swinging unless you're swinging with me. I'm ready to deal with the troublemakers as soon as you're ready to back me. That's what he's saying in the passage of Scripture, according to Barnes. Anyway, Barnes goes on to say this. He says, the church was to discountenance the enemies. Disfellowship them. The church was to discountenance the enemies of the Redeemer to show an entire readiness to sustain the apostle and to unite him in the uh, unite with him in the effort to maintain the discipline of Christ's house. So, um, for this conflict with the troublemakers to have the outcome that it needed to have, Paul was saying the the, the rest of the church. So there's these, all these people who say, you know what, Paul, you are right, and. Um, and we are behind you. We repent of our sin. Uh, but you know what? These people here, I know they disagree with you, but we sure love them. We don't, you know, we don't want to, uh, you know, we don't want to offend them. We sure don't want to upset these people because we love, I know they disagree with you and we agree with you, but, um, and I know they disagree with you, but, but we love them and we want to agree with you and agree with them too. And Paul said, I can't do anything with the troublemaker 
until you get on board with me. That's what's going on. So the conflict with the troublemakers, in order for it to have a successful outcome, the rest of the church had to support him by discontinuing fellowship with the troublemakers. And anything else would lead to less of a complete victory. And rather than seeing those people repent, would likely lead uh, to more people getting wrapped up in error. And so remember this, um, the purpose of the warfare is not to cast down persons, is to cast down imaginations. It's to bring people into obedience. We're not trying to, um, we're not trying to uh, uh, make people mad. We're not trying to drive people away. We're not trying to inflict punishment on others. What we are trying to do is bring them into obedience. And by not backing the man of God in his discipline of someone, because, well, I love this person. I sure don't want to, or I don't like conflict. I don't, I don't like being confrontational by not backing the preacher because you don't want confrontation or because you don't want to be up, offend this person or yeah, I know they're mad at the pastor, but I'm not mad at him. And, uh, and, uh, and by not backing the pastor in his stand, what you're doing is helping them continue in their rebellion. Um, some of the ways that that happens. One of the problems that we have today is there's a there's a, a preacher down in in Arizona. His name is Stephen Anderson. He's a uh, I call him a preacher, but he's a uh, he's a heretic. He he believes wrong doctrine. Uh, he's um, uh, in in a number of areas. He believes wrong doctrine. He's got a whole bunch of followers who uh, have kind of gone around the country. They try to infiltrate churches and cause problems in churches and, uh, you know, uh, and, and draw people out of churches to start these other kind of churches. And they all call themselves Baptists. They call themselves independent Baptists, but, um, but they, they don't believe the same thing we believe about um, salvation. They don't believe the same thing we believe about uh, eschatology. They don't believe the same thing that we believe they, uh, about, um, about uh, what a local church is. They don't believe those things. And so they come and say, well, we're independent Baptists just like you. And we get into the church and they start going around talking to people about, well, the pastor's wrong about on, on this stand. The pastor's wrong about this stand. And, 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 and because all of us have a rebellious nature, if we allow people to tell us of all these things that the pastor's wrong about, Pretty soon you start thinking, yeah. And, and some people get caught into the, 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 the wind of doctrine because of that. Christians um, who refuse to support the pastor's ministry by separate, uh, uh, separating themselves from um, the troublemakers, actually, um, they don't help the troublemaker, they don't help the pastor, and they also hinder their own ability to grow. They're, they're risking their own spiritual uh, growth by, by not standing with the pastor against these troublemakers. So that's what Paul says. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to revenge this disobedience. This, 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 this. I mean, he uses some pretty tar- tough words. You know, weapons, warfare, casting down, capturing, revenging are pretty tough words. But the point is not to run people off. The point is to see the troublemaker repent and be right to make dis- turn disobedience into obedience. And he says, I can't do it if you're not on my side. If you won't stand behind me, you won't be ready with me. I can't do it. All right, well, that's the lesson for this morning. And I'm one minute overboard, but don't overtime, but I'm not too bad today. So let's Father, I want to ask you now that your Holy Spirit will bless as we um, finish this Sunday school lesson and as we get ready for the morning service. I want to ask you, Lord, that you would um, that you uh, that you would uh, give us. Uh, I like the, the idea of uh, bring our thoughts into obedience of Christ. Father, I pray today in Jesus' name. Amen. God bless you. We're going to turn off everything and prepare for the next service.